we are live. <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. Okay, so welcome back to Live with Lola. I'm Savannah Lindquist, the communications coordinator here at the Ladies of Liberty Alliance. I am joined by Zuri Davis, all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Zuri is an assistant editor at Reason after graduating from Florida Atlantic University with a bachelor's degree in political science and government at the age of 18. She moved to Washington, D.C. to pursue political messaging. She previously worked at Rare and currently resides in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So tonight we're talking Black Lives Matter, which is uh, somewhat divisive, both within the liberty movement and outside of the movement. But let's start simple. When you say the phrase Black Lives Matter, what does that mean to you? So to me personally, <clears throat> and to a lot of people, it's um, a message that Black lives have been left behind. So it's really not that difficult to look at American history and see where Black Americans have gotten the short end of the stick. Um, so for a lot of those, um, or, or the way that it manifests itself right now is through bad policy. So we see that a lot with the criminal justice system, the war on drugs, bad economic policy. A lot of times black Americans are, <clears throat> or the government communicates to them that their lives are expendable and that it's okay to treat them any kind of way. And they don't really have, for a very long time, haven't had an advocate outside of their own community. So that's, um, just uh, the movement, I feel like um, it's kind of like an invitation to look at the community and see where the community is being left behind or actively suppressed. So that's what Black Lives Matter means to me. Gotcha. So um, the Black Lives Matter movement has been around for a couple years at this point. Um, you know, it's sort of public um, involvement in it sort of seems to ebb and flow, but after the death or the murder of uh, Mr. George Floyd, we've seen this sort of um, amplification that we've never seen before. So with that, uh, one of the most common arguments against Black Lives Matter that I hear, especially from libertarians um, is that the BLM organization has roots in Marxism. They advocate for policies that don't align with like many of the core beliefs of like a libertarian philosophy um, and therefore should not be supported by those in the liberty movement or those that identify as libertarian. So with this, you know, as a libertarian woman, how, how, why should libertarians support the BLM movement knowing all of this? So it's definitely important to recognize the differences between the organization and the movement. So um, the best way I try to explain this is with Uber. Um, so Uber has kind of taken on its own identity in the English language. So a lot of times um, Uber is like the default word for rideshare. So even if I call a Lyft, for example, I'm still gonna be like, oh, the Uber's here. Um, so kind of in the same way, um, we saw this a little bit leading up to the George Floyd protests, but certainly after the George Floyd protests, it was very clear that Black Lives Matter took on its own identity. And you even saw a lot of conservatives who before were very apologetic, I guess, during um, certain police involved shootings who were also posting Black Lives Matter, they were posting squares on Blackout Tuesday. They were very much part of the conversation to say, regardless of whatever the official organization is saying, this is obviously a movement that we all need to support and talk about. So um, it's very, it's been really nice to see um, the Libertarian Party um, post their support as well. So obviously presidential candidate Joe Jorgensen, um, she showed up to a Black Lives Matter vigil, um, which when I saw that really surprised me because um, they're, they're definitely uh, 
there's a huge contingency that's very against being a part of that um, just because of the organization. And then there's another contingency, which it was nice to see Joe Jorgensen be a part of this one, who says, hey, these are actually really important issues for libertarians, police accountability, um, violence, racism even. Um, these are things that we should talk about because we have solutions for them and we've been talking about them for a long time. This is actually a great outreach opportunity. Um, so actually, um, not to like completely like plug myself, but in the interview. It. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was able to interview her when she came to Nashville last week and she actually provided a really great example about how she's been using Black Lives Matter to reach out. So when she was in Oklahoma, she met a Black Lives Matter activist, and instead of just brushing him to the side, um, she embraced him, and she showed him how during the Montgomery bus boycott, for example, that the government, <laughs> uh, the, the buses were public, and on top of that, that the discrimination laws existed, even though most of the ridership was Black, and she compared that to the free market, for example, and she asked him to consider what would how how would Uber stay in business if it discriminated against the majority of his ridership? It wouldn't. Um, so, just using examples like that, like there are so many different inroads that we can take on the issue. And even if people don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about race, there's definitely state-sponsored discrimination. And we have decades and decades and decades of that to choose from. We still literally have the war on drugs. We have policing, all those things which disproportionately affect Black Americans, um, which is hard to dispute. Um, there, there are just so many ways we can talk about the issue because at the end of the day it really is a criminal justice issue and it's an economic issue and those are two things that i think um libertarians build the best bridges on um because there are some other issues where <laughs> people are still like i don't know if i want to go that far and i'm sure you can think of all those but definitely the criminal justice reform aspect and the economic aspect it's literally gift wrapped for us to take advantage of that. So, and then on top of that, libertarianism is essentially, um, it's for the people. So our entire premise is that the government should get out of way, out of the way of human flourishment. And what better uh, way to message that than to tell minorities who've been historically oppressed by that government to tell them that, hey, we agree with you, the government should get out of the way so that you can be the free people that you wanna be. Um, so I definitely, it's been nice to see different libertarians actually finding those inroads. And I hope that more people are inspired. And at the end of the day, if there are questions about the involvement, just reach out and ask, you know, don't sit back and make assumptions because that doesn't like it, it just reflects very poorly and negatively on our the libertarian movement. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned um, that it was with the the death of George Floyd that Black Lives Matter really took on this whole new sort of path, this whole new identity. Um, I'm curious as to if you have any thoughts about why Mr. Floyd's death, murder was the straw that broke the camel's back. Because it seems like, you know, for me, every time you turn on the news, you you see something like this and it's tragic. And every time we're just like, oh my gosh, like this is awful. You cry about it. And then it seems like people just move on. But with Mr. Floyd, it hasn't gone away. And I mean, and it shouldn't go away. It's a human rights issue. But I was wondering if you had any sort of thoughts about why Mr. Floyd's death is really the one of the ones that just completely changed the country in this aspect? Um, I will say just going back a little bit. Um, so what I do for work is I report on a lot of um, police abuse stories and police involved deaths, especially ones that are captured on camera. And I can honestly tell you that I was surprised. Um, I actually wrote the George Floyd story 
for a reason, the initial one. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked that it got the response that it did because reason, not, not even myself, but reason has covered so many of these stories for years and years and years and years. And none of them except um, maybe, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm blinking. Oh my golly, hold up. <laughs> New York. Oh my gosh. Mike Gardner? Was that his name? It's Eric Gardner. Gardner. <laughs> Eric Gardner. Oh my golly. I'm sorry. It's been a long day and I'm going to blame the on the fact that I was up at 6 a.m. Eric Gardner. So Eric Gardner's death was pretty much the only other death where it like kind of came close. I kind of judge it based on um, conservative involvement only because obviously um police officers and the whole law enforcement community, um, they belong to both major parties, but I think that conservatives do more of a service to like outreach, um, like the law enforcement community. So I kind of judge it based on um, are conservatives, uh, are they bothered by it for lack of a better word? So I know during the Eric Garner deaths, you saw a lot of people saying, hey, um, we weren't sure about Ferguson. We weren't sure about Trayvon Martin. We weren't sure about a lot of things, but we're pretty sure that Eric Garner's death was wrong. Um, and I feel like because it was captured on camera and because of the nature of what he was arrested for in the first place really didn't sit well with people. And I think for George Floyd, it was very similar. So what he was arrested for um, and the fact that it was captured on camera just really... I feel like that helps um, shock people a little bit. I think what also helped was there's the Ahmaud Arbery case um, in the Breonna Taylor death around the same time. And that was already on people's minds. Um, and then additionally with the pandemics, a lot of people haven't been distracted by things that they're usually distracted by. So not to crap on sports, because <laughs> there's definitely a time and a place for them. And I do enjoy them, I'm not just like, a hater, but because a lot of those things were canceled and a lot of people uh, didn't, like, they, they couldn't really leave their house. I feel like they had no other choice but to pay attention to the news. So mm -hmm. I think all of that wrapped into one finally pushed, um, it, 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 you definitely saw a lot of bipartisan outcry over the death, which I thought was really amazing. And you saw a lot of people get involved in the protests who usually would have stayed at home, which I thought was phenomenal. Yeah, it's been very interesting to to see um, that this sort of movement, I guess you could say, that has been so, it, so many people are divided over it. You know, the, the death of Mr. Floyd was just so senseless and, and just so evil that it, um, I think it woke a lot of, a lot of people up. Um, even people I, I, I know and love dearly were just like, oh, like, wow. Um, but yeah, so with the, the Eric Gardner case, that was, um, for people that don't know, do you want to share like a little bit about like what happened with him and in the, in, uh, the sort of outcry with I Can't Breathe after? So um, for obviously if people don't remember in New York um, a few years back, Eric Garner was captured on video. Um, he was being confronted by several NYPD officers. They were accusing him of selling Lucy's, which are single cigarettes, um, which are untaxed, which is against the law. Um, and as a result of that interaction, one of the officers used an illegal maneuver, he used a uh, maneuver, um, he used chokehold on him and he died um, be, as a result of that action, and I remember, um, that was actually around the time that I was starting to become more interested in criminal justice reform, and I think that death shocked me, because before, I kind of thought that, um, the criminal justice system was infallible, police officers were infallible, and that if people, if things happened during an arrest, it was just kind of like a means to an end, but, seeing that really stopped me in my tracks and made me think, wait, maybe there's a better way to do this. 
And I remember around the time, a lot of the conservative reaction was of shock, but also reminding people that um, something like that is the result of bad laws. So the fact that he essentially died over the state's tax revenue, it's really messed up actually. And his death is definitely a reminder of whenever you ask the government to pass more laws to make thing, to make behaviors that are nonviolent and that aren't harming anyone illegal, you're kind of opening the door for something like that to happen. Yeah, it, um, another argument that I've, I've heard quite a bit in regards to um, the George Floyd case, the Eric Gardner case of like, well, you should have just followed the law. <laughs> what are your, <laughs> okay, so you're laughing, but what are your <laughs> thoughts on that argument, like as a libertarian woman? It's hard. So um, obviously, um, like compliance is important. But when you watch some of these videos, a lot of times it's like three different officers shouting all different commands. Um, so we actually did a story at Reason a couple months ago. Um, the story was actually old, but the it was a police involved shooting in Florida and it was caught on camera but they redacted the part where the man was actually shot and killed. And for about six years, they said that um, they told him to put his hands up. And when he didn't put his hands up, they shot him. But the redacted part of the video, which it's about 11 seconds that they redacted, that someone actually released, um, like without the department knowing, it shows that there's... Um, it, the, sorry, the video actually showed all these different officers shouting different things at him and not actually giving him time to respond mm -hmm. um, and then shooting him almost immediately. So I feel like for a lot of the videos, people say that compliance is key. But one, for a lot of these videos, people aren't really given the opportunity to comply or they're being given confusing commands and that's not fair to expect them to be able to follow all of them. But on top of that, um, like police also have a responsibility um, and a duty to conduct themselves in a certain way. And I'm not saying if their lives are being immediately threatened that they, um, like I'm not here to tell them how to do their job but for a lot of these videos, you kind of see where violent enforcement is the default for nonviolent crimes, and that's an issue. So the best example I can give is um, in New York, uh, a lot of people were following the mask mandates, and um, there was like a whole weekend where it's just a series of videos of officers like beating up people for not wearing masks. And it's like, okay, the pandemic is serious and we should all be wearing masks and social distancing and all that stuff but is that really like is that person really worth beating up like they're not they didn't just kill someone they didn't just rob someone it's weird that that's the default and also the same weekend that all those videos were coming out the nypd was actually tweeting pictures of itself handing out masks to people so it's like okay there is actually a non-violent solution to your issue there. So I don't know why that that's what you chose to do instead. Yeah, there's, I guess part of me, it's been very interesting to see the response from various, you know, police stations, unions, whatever about like, well, if you defund the police or lower, you know, which a lot of people have a lot of different ideas of what defund the police means, what it looks like. Um, beliefs on whether or not it would work. Yeah, it, it's been interesting seeing there was, there was one uh, police like station and I don't remember where it was, but it was something along the lines of like, okay, well, if you cut our budget by, I think it was like 10%, it was like, that means we won't be able to investigate rape and murder. And it's like, well then like, where what are you doing with the rest of the money? Like, yeah interesting but uh so within the liberty movement um 
like I said before, it can be this issue specifically, people are very far on both sides of it. You know, for you as a as a black woman in the liberty movement, what do you want to see from your fellow libertarians? Um, definitely a lot more empathy, which I will say um, in my little corner, I've gotten a lot of great empathy and I've really appreciated all of the people who've reached out to me. Um, I've really appreciated seeing the discourse on that side. And it's been really like, it's very validating, I guess, um, which is very difficult because it can be a little lonely <laughs> being a black libertarian. Um, also, it's kind of lonely being a libertarian, first of all, being like a black woman <laughs> libertarian, it's like especially lonely. Um, so it's been nice to know that there's support. Um, but yeah, definitely for people who um, still have questions, like just to see the value of outreach, obviously, um, a lot of people make assumptions about Black Americans, especially Black voters and their values. And if you look at the Black community, it tends to be very conservative. It tends to be very distrusting of the government for good reason, because of American history. Um, there's a lot of small business mindedness. There's a lot of community involvement. Like there's so many community programs. Like it's very much a, we take care of our community and um, like, we're not gonna wait on the government to take care of us. We're going to fill the need as we see fit. Um, and it's, it's like, it's just the perfect outreach opportunity. And it's really frustrating, I guess, when people don't see the value in that. Um, and obviously they should do it um, more often than when it's an election year. You shouldn't just remember the black community every four years. You should always be thinking about them. And um, like, it's just so neglected by politicians. Republicans don't tend to compete for those votes and Democrats assume that they already have them. So a lot of times they don't show up in the communities, um, but there, there's really such a call for better representation and better answers. And I think that um, if libertarians, if they have the time just to spend some time reaching out to them and literally again, as I said, what better issue than to talk about criminal justice reform in economics, you know? Um, so, yeah. Good point. So, um, you know, we, we've spoken about this, like you and I, many times, but, um, you know, with libertarianism and, and with Black Lives Matter, an important thing to remember is that you know, so much of, of the violence and discrimination that um, that Black people have faced in our country's, you know, unfortunate history has been sanctioned by the state. Um, <clears throat> and that's that can definitely be a bridge to connect between, um, you know, libertarianism and, and the, the Black Lives Matter movement. So, you know, as as libertarians, liberty-minded people, you know, whatever you want to call us, how do we best stand in solidarity with the Black community? So um, sometimes it's as simple as showing up and not saying anything. So um, I have a friend here, actually, his name is Matt. Um, he's He does like a lot with the Libertarian Party of Tennessee. He has actually made a lot of inroads in North Nashville, which is the predominantly Black community in Nashville, which if you want to talk about communities that have been take advan taken advantage of and then forgotten about, it's definitely the North Nashville community. And like, it's such a beautiful historic community. It's had a lot of contributions to the music scene, like Jimi Hendrix used to play there, like when he would come into town, like just so many things. And it's sad to see what's happening, but... Um, for him, he has a lot of connections with the Black leaders in that community, and it's because he shows up and he listens. Um, and it's been really nice to see um, some other libertarian leaders just showing up to events and listening <laughs> and letting people tell them what their big issues are 
and then saying, oh, well, actually, this is something that libertarians have been talking about, and here's our solution, here's how we think um, we can help. So um, I know a lot of people get nervous because they think that they won't be received well. And of course, there's always, um, like, no matter where you go, there's always a chance that you won't be received well, or you'll just um, run to someone who's very adamant about the side that they're on already, but you'll actually find a lot more people who just want someone to listen. Um, and it literally costs nothing to be that person for them. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Just being kind and being willing to admit that you don't know everything. You know, I, I only know what life is like as, as a white woman from Virginia, you know, I, I don't know what you've experienced and, and what so many other people have. So with your, your role with Reason, you do a lot of reporting on um, criminal justice reform, police accountability. Uh, so throughout the time that you've, you know, really been learning about these stories and writing about these stories for people, have you seen the, the way that it's received change? I know that you did mention, you know, with the Eric Gardner case and with the George Floyd case that they're, those were the ones that like you saw even conservatives get very concerned about. Um, but I'm just interested to see like how for you, how that's evolved and changed over, you know, the time that you've, you've been covering that topic. Yeah, so um, definitely with all the protests this summer, I've seen a lot more eyes on it. Um, on some of the things that we've talked about and a lot of shock. So I will say for a lot of people, just to give grace, the reason why people don't talk about this issue is because they don't know how deep the problems are. Um, so for qualified immunity, for example, a lot of people don't realize how easy it is in some departments to be rehired, even if you do the worst possible thing. Um, so for a couple years now, Reason has actually been covering this one police officer, also based in Florida. A lot of crazy things happen in Florida. Um, yeah. But yeah, this guy has been arrested a couple of times. He's been fired by his department a couple of times. Some of the reasons why he's been fired and arrested is because he's beaten people up, <laughs> like he's stolen evidence. Like he's just done all sorts of awful things that if you and I did them, we definitely wouldn't have jobs. <laughs> but we because of, really fast. Oh yeah, we would definitely, oh yes, we would not have as many chances as this guy. Um, but because of the influence of the police unions where he is, um, he still has a job. And like when you tell people that, a lot of people just don't know. So I remember sharing that after people were starting to talk about police unions and qualified immunity and all of that. And I was like, hey, if you're shocked now, just wait until you read this story. And I just had people responding like, oh my God, like this, like we need to fix this now. So um, I definitely got a lot of responses like that. And I know for other writers who talk about more like prison reform issues, um, uh, drug laws and all that, they're also getting a lot of similar responses where people are just saying like, I didn't know this was a problem, but obviously people are being hurt by this and we need to do something about it. So it's been really nice to see um, just more eyes on the issue, so. Yeah, definitely visibility is, is so important. So where do you see us going from here? Where, like, what next? You know, now that we're aware of the issue, we know that this is happening. Now there's video evidence of it happening. So you can't argue that things are misconstrued when, you know, we're all watching the same video. Um, you know, wh where do we, where do we go from here? You know, we're in an election year where so many people are now aware of this issue. We're all stuck in our houses. And so you have to, you have nothing to do, but educate yourself. Um, what's next? Well, um, def definitely yes to everything you said. I think the next step is that criminal justice reform will finally be treated as a mainstream issue. And I know that it sounds weird to say that because obviously um, it's kind of been like a hot trendy topic for a while, but you definitely saw in the last election specifically 
um, when certain people dropped out of the presidential race, they stopped talking about criminal justice reform. So, um, for example, when Rand Paul dropped out of the primary, um, there weren't any more questions really uh, to the Republican presidential candidates about criminal justice reform issues. It's like, well, why is that? It's still an issue and it's an important one. And you've also seen in Congress a lot of times where uh, reform minded politicians will kind of put the issue on the back burner, which I, I, I guess it's unfair. If you are like a big policy wonk, then your issue is the most important issue. So I don't want to say that my like criminal justice reform is more important than taxes or foreign policy, because at the end of the day, it's all very important. Um, but for me personally, I do think it's one of the most important issues because we're talking about human lives. Um, we're talking about families. We're talking about generations and communities and something needs to be done to actually help those people. So it makes me very happy now that because there are so many eyes on the issue and because the flames are so hot, there's, there's probably going to be more of a demand for accountability, which will be really nice to see. Um, and like politicians are gonna have to talk about it so they can't just not put it on their platform anymore. And I think that's amazing. And hopefully one day that'll lead to um, greater change. Oh, uh, definitely on the federal level, you know, we're talking about like the drug war um, and some of the sentencing disparities there, but also on the state and local level, for sure. I think that that's gonna trickle down to those elections as well. Yeah, especially with it being a, a federal you know, or a presidential election year, you know, we're gonna have Joe Biden and Kamala Harris versus uh, Donald Trump and Mike Pence. So it'll be interesting to see how criminal justice reform is uh, handled with, um, you know, we've seen what Donald Trump and, and Mike Pence think and have done. Um, and, you know, with Kamala Harris being <laughs> herself, um, it'll be interesting to see uh, what, what happens here. So, um, another thing I, I wanted to briefly cover is the idea of all lives matter wasn't a statement until Black Lives Matter became a, became a thing, became a, a rallying cry, if you will. Um, you know, with your beliefs and uh, you know, yourself as a, as a libertarian woman, as a black woman, what is your response to all lives matter? Definitely just to listen more. That's like my first and foremost, just stop and listen. Um, in the area where I grew up, it's very much, um, hesitant to talk about race. Um, which is unfortunate because it's also caused a lot of hurt, just the things that people have said or the things that people haven't said. Um, and it, a lot of times those people, they definitely mean well when they say all lives matter. And a lot of times when they say all lives matter, they also mean black lives. But the at the end of the day, um, it's so hard to ignore the disparities <laughs> in this country. Um, and when someone's telling you that they're hurting, it's weird to tell them that they're actually not. Like there are so many lived experiences that I have um, growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up in, that if I told um, some people in my professional circle, like they'd have no idea what that's like. So for example, um, like the police department, it was actually around um, the corner from us. And whenever we'd call the police, they'd never show up. And the one time the police did show up, it's because my mom put on a voice to make herself sound like a white woman, you know? And she indicated that she was in trouble um, that way. And like police officers showed up. But every time she called in her normal voice, like <laughs> they weren't there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's just like, that's a very little, uh, that like, that's a small example. 
but so many black people have just the experience not only do they have the experience but it's also very much a generational thing um so between like my grandparents my parents and myself we've all lived in very different americas but there are still some experiences that we all have that tie us together and it's very negative um and it's very painful going through that and to tell someone that that's what's happening just for them to turn around and say i don't believe you because i didn't experience that like it's essentially gaslighting and that's never okay and if you care about someone you're not going to do that to them yeah especially a an entire community at yeah at large. so the last question i have for you is is something that we've touched on um, a bit throughout this discussion, but if you had to just break it down into just like, if someone just happened to ask you like, well, why should I support the Black Lives Matter movement? Like as someone that's like a libertarian or quote unquote conservative, um, you know, like why does it matter? Well, it matters because the treatment that we accept for the quote unquote least of us that's the treatment that we eventually accept for ourselves so a lot of times um people hesitate to get involved with certain movements so um like <laughs> black lives matter gay rights even um like immigration <laughs> you know a lot of people will think like well i don't experience it so it'll never be something um, like the policies, the policy decisions that are made now, I don't have to worry about them. Uh, I always feel like that's really wrong at the end of the day. I feel like that's always leaving the, that's letting government get its foot in the door mm -hmm. to discriminate. And whatever you tolerate for other people, eventually that's how government's going to treat you. Because you kind of see um, whenever the government commits abuse, it's never an overnight thing. It's always very much an incremental thing. Um, and a lot of times we wonder how we got here. Well, how did we let the government treat minorities? <laughs> like, did we actually stand up and say, hey, um, when you do this, that's actually not okay? Or did we let it happen and then not say anything until it crept up in certain communities? And the best example I can give of that is the war on drugs, how, um, when it was primarily affecting Black Americans um, during the crack epidemic, it was very much like, yes, we need to lock those people up, we need to protect the children, all that. Um, but now that the war on drugs has kind of shifted to the opioid epidemic and it started to affect um, suburban households, now the conversation is very different. Um, and now we have to treat people um, with more grace, which is very true, and we should always do that. But it's just for a lot of people, they're they're wondering how their babies are being locked up for so long, and it's like, okay, well, ever since like the '80s and '90s, um, mm -hmm. Black Americans have been facing the same thing. Um, so now that you're experiencing that, it's great to use the influence you have now to change that policy, which I think we're actually seeing a lot more policy change now because of it, which is actually a good thing. But um, a lot of times you don't even have to get to that point. We can speak up now. So yeah, <laughs> that was a long winded answer, but yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it, it made sense. It makes sense. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me, to share your experiences and, um, you know, your, your opinions and, and I very much appreciate it. So thank you. And, um, I will talk to you later. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. <laughs> okay. Bye guys.